Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Markia, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those just voyaging into the dark with us for the first time, welcome. With Earth Day coming up, we tend to take a better look at the planet around us. Typically, we see the lush trees, dancing rivers, and the earth on which we ground ourselves. But the climate is changing, and Mother Nature isn't happy. Hidden in her darkest corners lurk powerful crystals, trees that breathe, and monsters that would do anything to protect the sacred secrets of the earth, especially if that means killing humans. First, nature's always listening, followed by a deadly family secret. Then, a trapped soul's revenge. Finally, in our featured story, the shrill cry of death. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week, and of those, the scariest ones make it into our podcast, along with the story that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com snarled. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary at snarled.com. If you'd like to support Something Scary, then consider joining our Patreon. As a patron, not only can you help the show and see ad-free episodes, But you can also be a part of the horror and hear your name featured in one of our podcasts or weekly video stories. Visit patreon.com slash snarled. So, want to hear something scary? Wrath of Mother Earth. The Earth is a thing of wonder and beauty. Nature should be respected and cared for. But not everyone acts that way, so at times, nature fights back. Like in this story written by Janine. As Brianna strolled along the side of the lake, she looked in disgust at the color of the water and the sight of dead fish floating on the surface. This used to be a beautiful spot. It was a place her parents used to come on picnics when they were dating. Now, thanks to the careless people of the town, Trash was regularly dumped here, endangering the wildlife. On top of that, the waste from a nearby factory was being pumped into the water, slowly poisoning the fish. Gross, she thought. She'd want it to cool off after her walk, but she was not brave or foolish enough to swim in that water. Her cell buzzed as she continued her walk. Hey, Tino. Yeah, I'll be home soon. I was going to stay here for a few, but it is disgusting. No wonder no one comes here. Nature is so gross. As Brianna continued complaining about how awful the area was, she didn't notice the water beginning to bubble. She frowned at her cell. The coverage seemed to be cutting out, and the call dropped. This place sucks, she muttered wondering how far it was to get back to the parking lot where she had left her bike. It was meant to be a loop trail around the lake, so she knew she was walking in a circle, but it just seemed to be taking way longer than she'd planned. Her parents had suggested she get outside and soak up some fresh air and sunshine, but now she wished she'd just gone to the mall instead. As she carried on, trying to text and examining the bars, she heard a series of splashes from the water. Suddenly, despite the late afternoon sun still bearing down, she shivered. She also sped up her walk, breaking into an almost run. Looking back over her shoulder, she had the distinct feeling she was being watched. But there was no one there. There was no one anywhere around her. Where the heck is the lot? She grumbled, starting to get out of breath now that she was jogging. There was a noise behind her, like a branch snapping. Panic set in along with thoughts of being attacked. She continued jogging while trying her cell again. She was so focused on the screen, she didn't see a vine snake out of the murky water and onto the path in front of her. Brianna tripped and fell flat onto her face, her cell smashing on the ground. Before she had time to curse or get back up, another long, slimy vine from the lake whipped up 
and curled itself around her ankles. Since she was still face down, she didn't see it, just felt the jolt as it dragged her into the water. Panic set in, and Brianna used her hands to try and claw into the plants around her as something with super strength pulled her further and deeper into the lake. It was useless. Her nails scraped along the mud and broke off as the vines around her ankles dragged her down, her lungs filling with water. Once they had pulled her to the bottom of the lake, just before the darkness took over, other monstrosities and aberrations caused by the chemicals in the water surrounded her. By the time she was reported missing and the authorities found her bike and cell, all that was left of Brianna was fish food. Thank you so much, Janine, for writing this story for us. Have you ever been outside and felt as though something is watching you, even though nobody is there? As if somehow nature is keeping its eye on you. Just because something is beautiful on the outside doesn't mean the inside isn't pure evil. Like in this story, inspired by Samuel. Alcina was sitting on her boyfriend Emmett's bed, trying to comfort him. They had both taken a nap in between college courses, but Emmett had had a terrible nightmare. He'd awakened, screaming, and clutching at the carved emerald stone he wore around his neck. To be honest, Alcina always thought it was just part of his goth wardrobe. A green stone on a thin leather strap with a screaming face etched onto it. She never really thought it was more than a Hot Topic type of accessory until she saw him grasp it the way he had in his sleep. When he calmed down, he blamed his behavior on the bad dream. But when Alcina brought up the necklace, he shut down the conversation immediately. Undeterred and curious, she asked if she could wear it. He paused and stared deeply into her eyes as he said that he would never burden her like that. This unusual response only made her more confused. What could he mean? A couple of nights later, they decided to stay at Emmett's dorm together. Alcina would go out for pizza while Emmett hopped in the shower. Alcina grabbed her purse and headed for the door as she watched Emmett take off his necklace and place it within his nightstand. As soon as she heard the shower running, she doubled back and dove to the drawer, observing the tortured face on the stone. Feeling a pull, she quickly put it on. Instantly, Her body felt light and her mind empty. She was numb, otherworldly voices echoing around her. Alcina fell to her knees but didn't register the impact. She was suddenly overwhelmed with pain, her heart burning as if made of fire. She tried to scream but had no control over her body as if she was paralyzed. A pair of black boots walked across the floor in front of her, but she couldn't raise her head to see who it was. The figure lifted Alcina's face with its hand and looked down at her with a horrifying grin. He had bloody, broken, yellow teeth and globs of spittle on his prickly chin. His baggy overalls were covered in bloodstains. He looked vaguely familiar but she couldn't fathom how. The man moved his blood-crusted hand to Alcina's neck and his eyes grew wide, ecstatic and sadistic, enjoying the show. He tightened his grip around her neck until her windpipe ached and her lungs begged for oxygen. She could hear the bones crunching. The man's face neared hers. Don't worry. I'll make it fast, he rasped. She suddenly recognized who it was. The face, the face etched on the emerald. How was that possible? 
but she was unable to question any further. The light began to fade as she heard a loud snap. When Alcina awoke, she was looking down at the floor where her body had been. There was now just an empty space, and somehow she was floating above it. She screamed into the void, no longer corporeal, just energy in another realm. Emmett came out of the shower to find his girlfriend gone. The necklace laid on the floor. Emmett picked up the pendant and looked at it sadly. He knew what had happened. The only way to escape the earth stone and for your soul to be set free was to trap another, making them take your place. Emmett was a keeper. His only mission, just like his father and his grandfather before him, was to ensure this stone was kept out of anyone's hands. It could not be destroyed or buried. Emmett's family line was immune to its powers and had been keeping the same tormented soul inside it. A murderer from the early 1900s for decades. But Emmett had been careless. He just wanted a small break without it being around his neck. And now, Alcina's terrified face adorned the stone, begging to be freed. The only thing Emmett could do now was to make sure it didn't happen again. As much as he wanted the soul of the woman he loved to be set free, the only way to do it would mean another murder. And he couldn't allow that to happen again. Thank you so much, Samuel, for inspiring this story for us. Are there any pieces of antique jewelry in your family? Any that you think are holding a deep secret? If they're haunted, tell us about it at somethingscary@snarl.com. What are your favorite spring cleaning projects? Cleaning out your closet, tossing your old makeup, it's also a great time to do some mental decluttering too. Over time, thoughts and emotions can build up. You may feel overwhelmed by it all. It might be time to think about scheduling an appointment to connect with a therapist at Talkspace. Therapy has made a huge difference in my life, and I'm pretty sure it'll make a big difference in yours too. So for anyone who's looking to get started with therapy, I recommend Talkspace because they make it so easy to match with a licensed therapist and schedule a session. Talkspace therapists are available to speak anytime you need. And you can also get unlimited messages with your dedicated therapist. But no matter where you are in your mental health journey, talking to a therapist who's trained to help makes a huge difference. If thoughts and emotions are piling up, Fresh Perspective can help you feel better. Match with your dedicated therapist today at Talkspace.com and use promo code SCARY during sign-up to get $100 off your first month. That's $100 off at Talkspace.com, promo code SCARY. If someone is calling out to you by name, but you don't know them or what they want, ignore them and run. Like in this story inspired by Anonymous. Thank you to our Patreon, Cassia, whose name we use in this story. Cassia had grown up in Whaleyville, Maryland, a quaint little town population of just 246. It was the kind of place where everyone knows everyone and they're likely related. The history and bloodlines ran deep. Legend told of their own version of the more famous events in Salem, too. Back in 1692, the townspeople began putting women on trial they believed were witches. And when found guilty, which they always were, they were either burned alive or strung up by their necks upon the hanging tree in the town square. Cassia had heard stories throughout the years. The witch's tree still stood in the middle of town, a bizarre-looking cypress with many gnarled branches, a trunk the size of a house with odd-looking bumps all over it. On top of all that, it was black. Every piece of wood and splinter, pitch black. And no leaves would grow on it no matter the season. Yet, 
it managed to stay sturdy and immovable. The town, while appearing to laugh off the rumors, was still too suspicious to have the eyesore removed or too afraid. Following in her family's footsteps, Cassia began work as a junior seamstress in a shop belonging to her mom's friend on the other side of town. It was within walking distance from her house, but her route passed right by the witch's tree, probably the closest she had ever been to it. She felt a cool breeze slide by her, giving her goosebumps. She chalked it up to the weather since it was getting closer to fall. Over the next few weeks, she noticed how loud the creaking of the branches were, but only when she was near it. There were no leaves to rustle, and yet it sounded like something was whispering to her, whispering her name. As soon as she was out of reach, they settled. She mentioned it to her mom, who suggested she take the longer route around the town instead, saying the tree held on to the innocent souls of the wrongly accused. This was the first time Cassia heard anyone in town actually show their fear for the witch's tree. So Cassia did just that. She took an extra 20 minutes both ways to walk around the town just to avoid the tree. Until she slept through her alarm and was running half an hour late. She knew her mom would be upset if she was late, so she rushed, heading straight through the center of town, unable to avoid the tree. She stopped momentarily, right before passing it. Despite the clear sky, ominous dark clouds swirled above. Cassia clutched her purse and began to jog, hoping to pass it as quickly as possible. As soon as she reached the space under the branches, they began to bend down and in toward her. The tree was coming alive. All the branches were twisting and turning to grab at her. The air around her was filled with screaming as the accused women writhed in anguish at their misjustice. Cassia's purse was ripped from her body and she was thrown to the ground. The tree began to paw at her, scraping and cutting her. Suddenly, her mom appeared, having realized Cassia was late and that she would likely take the shortcut. She didn't get close enough for the branches to ensnare her also, but just the sight of her mom gave Cassia a second wind. And with all of her strength, she rolled out from under the tree, leapt up, and ran to her mother. She was covered in cuts and bruises, but alive. They watched in horrified silence as the screaming, bent tree manipulated itself back to its original form and was quiet. The clouds cleared, the sun reappeared, and all was back to normal. Cassia never took the shortcut again, especially after the missing person posters started appearing all over town. Thank you so much, Anonymous, for inspiring this story. Dear listener, have you ever heard a call from something in nature? Do you think it was a figment of your imagination? Or was there something more, like a spirit that was calling you? Deep in the jungles of Brazil are those who would do whatever it takes to protect their sacred land. Get in their way at your own risk. Alex and Marla were excited for their family's vacation to Brazil. It had been Anna's idea, a chance for their fractured family to bond. Of Alex and Marla's two children, Anna was their golden child, well-behaved and very clever with straight A's. Her older brother, Seb, was, well, the opposite, in both grades and in maturity. Anna had also been born deaf, and Seb resented her for that as well. No matter how his parents tried to reward or discipline him, he always seemed to push back. He would claim that although he'd come first, he felt 
second best. Along with healing their family dynamic, Alex and Marla hoped this vacation would help Seb garner some control over his increasingly hostile behavior, especially towards his sister. They landed in Sao Paulo and took a bus to a beautiful campsite. As they drove through the entrance, they saw a sign that read, Vida Malor, that meant better life, and it was. The site had its own lake and the cabins were charming. They were a day ahead of the usual vacationing crowds, so would even have a peaceful night all to themselves. But heading over to check-in, the signs posted became more ominous. In capital letters, they warned campers to pick up after themselves and to respect the grounds, because if they did not, they would face the wrath of the Kurupira. Alex and Marla chuckled. What a cute way to remind guests not to drop trash. But Anna was curious and Googled Kurupira on her phone. Hey, so a Kurupira does exist, she continued. It's a mythical creature whose name means covered in blisters. It has red and orange hair. Its feet are backwards as a way to throw off anything hunting after it. As she read aloud, her parents smiled, but Seb just rolled his eyes. Nobody asked you, that's so dumb. He scoffed. Well, let's hope we don't make it mad then, Anna warned. It says here that it gives off a high-pitched noise that can make people go insane. Kicking at some loose dirt, Seb grabbed his stuff and stormed into the cabin. That evening, it was clear Seb wasn't having a good time. He didn't want to swim or fish with everyone else and complained 24-7. The rest of the family was having a blast while Seb became increasingly agitated. After dinner, Alex, Marla, and Anna sat around a fire pit making s'mores and looking out over the lake. It was blissful until Seb appeared, his negative energy immediately dampening the mood. He teased Anna about still enjoying kid snacks, then grabbed her treat and threw it into the water. When Anna got upset over him bullying her yet again, Seb stormed off, kicking a trash can onto the ground causing his contents to spill everywhere. At his mother's look, Seb then sneered and ran inside the cabin, slamming the door. Anna begged and pleaded to sleep with her parents tonight, just in case Seb tried to take it out on her. Alex shook his head, saying he'd be taking Seb fishing early in the morning so they could talk it out. He asked Marla to make sure Anna would be okay tonight. Later that night, There was rustling outside of Seb's bedroom window, then a tapping, as if someone was trying to get his attention. He sat up groggily, just as a shadow passed by the window. Figuring it was some type of a prank, Seb jumped from his bed to see who was messing with him. He crept out the front door and looked around. There was nobody there. He turned to go back inside and was quickly shoved to the ground, Looking back over his shoulder, his indignation turned to abject fear. The Kurupira loomed over him. Covered in bright orange hair like a Sasquatch, its face was half human and half animal. Its mouth opened, revealing three inch long teeth and it let out a horrific wail. Seb covered his ears, but it was no use. The resonating noise made him feel like red hot needles were being poked into his brain. Alex startled awake at an unearthly howl and rushed out of the main bedroom. He checked on Anna first. She was still loudly snoring away with Marla asleep next to her wearing earplugs. He saw Seb's room was empty and tiptoed outside. He saw a giant, hairy creature picking something up, maybe some type of large animal, and slamming it down repeatedly over a stump. Usually, he would run away at such a sight, but something compelled him forward. And that's when he saw that this monstrous orange thing had Seb, his son. His body lay twisted over the stump, his back and neck broken. Howling himself, Alex grabbed a heavy branch and ran towards this murderous thing. The creature lobbed him into a huge tree, killing him instantly. Anna and Marla slept on, totally unaware of what had transpired. 
The next morning, Marlo walked through the empty cabin. Alex? Sub? She called out, wondering where they could be. Then she stepped outside and saw the carnage. There was so much blood. And that was when it sank in and she started to scream. Other campers were arriving and heard her, quickly rushing to her aid, alerting the authorities and moving her away from the distressing scene. Anna was still rubbing the sleep out of her eyes as her mother ran in and engulfed her in an embrace. Her mother held her, shaking as she tearfully tried to explain and sign what had happened. Anna looked shocked, and she buried her face into her mom's chest. And there... Her expression quickly turned to satisfaction. As it was Anna who had chosen this place to begin with, having researched the Kuropira, she knew how her horrific bully of a brother would behave. And she knew that her inability to hear the fatal screech would keep her and her parents safe, who wore earplugs at night whenever she slept with them due to her loud snoring. Her dad, Alex, had been an unfortunate byproduct of her plan. But she had begged them both. And because her dad had allowed Seb to get away with so much bullying, it seemed only fair in the end. Now it was just her and her mom. This week's podcast stories were edited by Markia McCarty, Sarah Lukasiewicz, and Janine Pipe. Narration by Markia McCarty. Audio edited and mixed by Fitz Harris. Additional audio editing by Calvin Linderman. Art and graphics by Mari Carlson. Produced by Hannah Mullen and Markia McCarty. Executive producer, Gail Gilman. Music by Sapphire Sandalo and Calvin Linderman. <laughs>